Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it another minute to allow everyone to um, come into the room for this afternoon's presentation. It's been an amazing day here in New Jersey. The conference um, has been just so stimulating. I'm just looking forward to this panel uh, and exploring more of the history of memory with all of you. Um, and so we'll just allow a couple more people to join us. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions um, during the presentations, please put them in the Q&A box um, and we'll be able to answer them at the end of the program. Hopefully we'll be able to get to everyone's questions. In the chat box, I put a link for the New Jersey Historical Commission's mailing list. If anyone's interested in joining our mailing list and you're not a part of it, please click on the link um, later after the program and please join our mailing list and share with any of your friends who may be interested in joining. Okay, so I think I'm going to start this amazing program. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my hello, good afternoon. My name is Noelle Lorraine Williams, and I am the director of the African American History Program here at the New Jersey Historical Commission. This panel, Examining Memory and Indigenous Perspectives in New Jersey's Past, is a highly significant and contested topic, mainly because Indigenous perspectives in New Jersey have a hidden in plain sight quality. Memories of the settler and colonial past are woven throughout our everyday here in New Jersey, in our towns, cities, streets, and high school names and histories. Yet authentic representations of indigenous histories are often ignored, suppressed, and hidden. We are happy to welcome our two panelists to continue the conversation in investigating and illuminating these histories. Our first presenter will be Dr. Christopher J. Slaby. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at the College of William and Mary his presentation will be Washington's Double Crossing, Indigenous Perspectives on the Memory of the American Revolution in New Jersey. Our second presenter will be Dr. Stephen Hahn, Professor Emeritus at the Department of English, William Patterson University. His paper is called Acknowledgement and Erasure of Indigenous Presence and White Settler Guilt in Washington Irving's on Passaic Falls, a poem of 1806. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I would like to welcome Dr. Slaby. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. This will be an image heavy presentation. So um, don't you don't have to watch me talking and reading. Um, instead, look at um, what I hope are some fascinating and compelling images. Um, let me just adjust my screen so I can actually see it. So I'm talking about Washington's double crossing, indigenous perspectives on the memory of the American Revolution in New Jersey. And um, I should say a few things up front. The, the first thing is that this is um, a bit of a weird talk maybe, Ho hopefully in a way that everyone will enjoy but um, it's a bit all over the place and it's certainly a bit preliminary. So for anyone in the audience who has been working on Lenape and 
um, indigenous history of New Jersey for decades. One, I apologize. And two, please uh, give me all your feedback and all your thinking. Um, I, I very much would like to know what others think about this. Um, I've put in the title, the memory of the American Revolution in New Jersey. So this is a talk about history, but really more memory and representation. Not exactly what happened at a particular moment, but what that moment has signified and how it's been represented since that time. And um, as you'll see shortly, um, this isn't the entire American Revolution in New Jersey. Obviously, there are particular moments that people tend to remember. Um, but, but as the, the title, the main title might suggest, what I'm focusing on is Washington's crossing of the Delaware as a as a sort of representational tool. Um, two other uh, quick things. It's a weird talk, I think, again, in a good way, I hope, because this is part of a much larger project on what I'm calling indigenous histories of the Delaware River. Um, and focusing on indigenous perspectives and experiences kind of turns a lot of things on their head, um, including place and location, right? So. Um, this is a New Jersey history conference, and ostensibly I'm talking about New Jersey, but the Lenape homeland, Lenape Hoking, is much bigger than just New Jersey, um, and it traverses not just the land, but also the water, including the Delaware River. So this project is an outgrowth of that, and one of my first times of uh, doing a bit of thinking out loud about that. Um, and the last thing I'll say uh, at the beginning is, is something that's become a bit more popular nowadays. People have heard these already today um, and, and hopefully have heard them elsewhere. But I wanna begin by recognizing myself and where I am physically in relationship to indigenous peoples, indigenous history and indigenous homelands. So I'm a PhD candidate at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and we have recently crafted our own um, land acknowledgement, a recognition of the indigenous lands that we occupy by being here. So I'm just going to briefly read the statement that was crafted last year. Like peer institutions around the country, William and Mary seeks formally to acknowledge the original indigenous inhabitants of the state-owned land on which the Williamsburg campus resides and has partnered with their present-day descendants to create appropriate language. After consultation and input from Virginia tribal leaders in August 2020, President Rowe approved the following statement. William and Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our campus is on today. The Charonhaka or Nottaway, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Mattapani, the Monacan, the Nansamon, the Nottaway, the Pamunkey, the Potawomac, and the Upper Mattapani and Rappahannock tribes. And we pay respect to their tribal members past and present. Um, I think it's important to do this kind of recognizing, but I also want to note uh, two, two things about land acknowledgements. The first is that, again, hopefully people have been hearing about these things, maybe even doing them yourselves, but um, as the name implies, right, a land acknowledgement suggests a very particular circumscribed kind of place, a piece of land. My talk today in some ways is about water, so that already pushes us to the edges of what a land acknowledgement might mean or suggest. But I'd like to push that even further, given the fact that this is a virtual conference, uh, given the fact that many of us have been existing in a virtual way for a year and a half now, and recognize the complexities of, of relationship and belonging in this country, as well as other countries where there are both indigenous peoples and colonizers or settlers. Um, so I'm in, I'm in Virginia, you are all in the greater New York metropolitan area, New Jersey, um, and we are being connected by these forms of technology um, and infrastructure. And all of those are on indigenous land and making use of indigenous resources, but that actually doesn't get particularly well acknowledged even when we do things like a land acknowledgement. And this is, I think, something new that people are thinking about. So I would just, um, uh, ask that everyone reflect even further on what it means to be entwined in systems and places that are on indigenous land, especially when they continue to go unrecognized because of complexities like, you know, existing virtually. Um, the other thing to say about land acknowledgements is, and again, hopefully some people have heard this, um, there is criticism of them as sometimes just being lip service. Okay, we've acknowledged whose land we're on, check. <laughs> 
we don't have to do anything else. We don't have to actually work with indigenous communities to um, rectify past and ongoing injustices, for example, right? And so that's a problem. Um, and I, I don't know that we've necessarily come to a great solution to that besides the fact that we have to acknowledge that a land acknowledgement cannot stop at just reading a statement out loud. Okay, this is hopefully a good segue from, from land acknowledgements. I've got two pairs of maps for everyone to look at. Um, the United States or greater North America on the left and then on the right, what we might think of as roughly New Jersey. Um, so the map on the bottom left and the kind of map in the middle is just a Google map image, the kind of thing that everyone's used to looking at. But the map in the top left and all the way on the right comes from a website called native-land.ca. It's a great resource. And what you can do on that website is type in any place name um, all over the world for countries with indigenous populations. And you can find out rather than the colonial political boundaries that exist, like the state of New Jersey or the United States, you can find out um, whose indigenous land you're on. And so on the left, again, you can see the diversity, the great diversity of indigenous nations and communities and peoples in North America. And then on the right, again, you get this troubling of, well, we think of New Jersey as this bounded entity. But that kind of conflicts, or at the very least overlaps, with indigenous senses of place and belonging, Lenape Hoking, which traverses both the uh, political boundaries of the state of New Jersey as well as the terrestrial boundaries that we tend to think of. So it's important to me today to stress these kinds of boundary crossings because, in some ways, the jumping off point for this talk is a painting which I'm guessing most people have seen either in person or in some form uh, replicated. Um, if not this version of it, then some version of a version of it. It's one of the most iconic images of American art, not actually made by an American artist, Emanuel Loitza, of an event that uh, takes place during the American Revolution, but is actually depicted um, almost 100 years later, not quite. But um, And so it's an interesting artifact of the stories we tell about the past in that way. Um, but it's also an interesting artifact of what I would say is a colonial memory of the revolution, right? So this is an event that happens. Um, Washington brings troops from Pennsylvania to New Jersey, um, which makes the image kind of weird, right? Because it should be going the other way if you're looking north, um, uh, to give a surprise attack to a bunch of Hessian forces um, you know, at Christmas and it was cold and snowy. And, and so it was a very arduous journey and it was a somewhat decisive route. And it was not a single turning point, but a major um, important point in the Revolutionary War. And obviously that then gets remembered after the fact uh, as a triumphal moment in the creation of the American nation. Um, let's see, but, <laughs> I think it's important again to, to think about what's actually being depicted here. We've got Washington, you know, standing tall on the boat, um, and they're crossing the Delaware River, which then becomes part of uh, you know the bodies of water of the United States. Um, obviously, prior to this, it was also more complicated, right? You had uh, the English and other Europeans coexisting, or or not so well coexisting with indigenous peoples. Lenapes and others, um, but it never ceased to be Lenape Hoking or Lenape land. Um, yet you don't see that in, in this painting, right? In Emmanuel Loitz's painting. There's one figure on the, on the right side you can see wearing moccasins um, and has a beaded bag and a fur hat. And people have talked about um, whether that's an indigenous figure or whether it's a reference to indigenous peoples. It's not 100% clear, but even that figure alone, right, doesn't necessarily give the full sense that this is indigenous land, or in this case, water. Um, this is Lenape Hoking. That kind of gets erased, right? I mean, the central figure, to go back, is right there, George Washington, the founder of the country, and that's what gets celebrated. Um, and so this talk um, today, I'd like to briefly uh, uh, draw that out a little bit about the, the memory of this event and what it means for the revolution, but then and, and the country that's founded as a result of the revolution, but, but have us think about indigenous reactions and reflections on what that actually means. Um, uh, I should give a content warning 
at the beginning, as people might have need to do for any talk on the history of indigenous peoples in this country, but um, it's obviously often a uh, an unpleasant story, a violent story, um, a, a, a story of Euro-Americans who do not necessarily always have the best um, impression of indigenous peoples. And we get this from the beginning of the United States. Uh, I think most people who don't deal with indigenous history or don't think about these things aren't aware, but the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances or complaints against the king and the crown and, and the, uh, the British system overall. But the final complaint um, says, uh, against the king, he has excited domestic insurrectionists among us, amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So I, I think people might be aware that there's lots of debate about uh, the founding and the revolution and the founding fathers and documents and slavery. And, and race, these questions of African Americans in the new nation. Um, you know, was the American with the 1619 project, was the American Revolution fought as a pro slavery measure, as an anti slavery measure? And, you know, scholars as well as other people are having uh, various um, degrees of arguments, variously informed or not degrees of arguments about that. But I think it's inarguable that. The founding of the United States was based on this idea of, again, quote unquote, merciless Indian savages. It was founded on the idea of um, these uh, Europeans being scared that Indians will continue to resist the taking of their land and the violence that had been inflicted upon them. That is built into the whole system from the beginning. And so I think this is what we need to be thinking about when we see this kind of heroic image of George Washington crossing the Delaware. It's a much more complicated story than just, okay, they've won the war and the United States was founded and we have democracy and freedom. For whom, right? Um, I've got a map here that might load, okay. I hope everyone can see this. This is um, a spectacular map that was created by uh, Claudio Sant, the historian and um, the journalist and historian Rebecca Onion for uh, Slate Magazine. And it shows the uh, ongoing taking of native land. So obviously prior to the revolution, indigenous peoples in the Americas were in an ongoing uh, conflict over control of their land. The Europeans in the process of colonization were continuously trying to take that land. When the United States was founded in 1776, that process just switches from an English perspective from the British to the Americans. And so the founding and expansion of the United States manifest destiny is not just uh, the growth of the United States nation, it's the ongoing history of uh, conflict, of forced conflict between Americans and indigenous peoples. And so in this map, you can see the continued march westward of- uh, uh, Dr. Slaby, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I think you have to activate the link to the map. Oh, is it not? Uh... Yeah, it's not activated. Oh, shucks, here, we can, I could do this. My apologies. Oh, can okay, you see that's... this one? Okay, great. I, oh, great, thank you. you. You can see this one? Yes, Okay. thank you. Sorry. So the first one is a better map. You can go look that up, um, Claudio Sant on S-A-U-N-T on uh, slate.com. This is an abbreviated one and it moves very fast. I apologize for that. Um, right, this was a process that unfolded over a hundred plus years of colonization and here it's getting rapidly um, uh, condensed. But anyway, the important thing to take away from this map, it's, it's rather drastic if you look at it, especially the slow version over time. Um, it's this reminder of the, the country was founded and then it continued to grow, to expand, to, to become what it is today in many ways. Um, but the other side of that coin is what was that? That was colonization. That was the ongoing um, attempt to take indigenous land from indigenous peoples. And so again, that's the context that I think we need to keep in our heads when we look at paintings like Lloyd's Washington Crossing the Delaware. And it's important to note that 
right? That map shows the, the larger forces of manifest destiny and colonization, but that happened to pretty much every uh, tribal nation. And so here's a, a great map from uh, Bryce Obermeyer's book, Delaware Tribe and a Cherokee Nation, that shows the various force removals of Lenape's. Um, and of course, this, this began before the revolution. And so uh, by the time of the revolution, Lenape's are already forcibly removed and displaced from their Lenape hooking ho homeland. Um, they're in what is now Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio. Um, and then they get further uh, displaced. Which is interesting because the history of the relationship between Lenape's and the United States um, is one that changes over time. Somewhat famously, perhaps infamously in hindsight, uh, there was the Fort Pitt Treaty of 1778, which was basically the first treaty between the United States and a foreign nation. And so in this treaty, the, 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 the nascent United States acknowledged the sovereignty of what, what they called the Delawares and what Lenape's also called themselves in English, Delawares. And it's these six short articles, but you can see here right in the last article that the United States says it will uh, guarantee to a foresaid nation of Delawares and their heirs all their territorial rights in the fullest and most ample manner. By 1778, that's already not true because Lenape's have been forcibly removed, right? So it's it's an interesting document in that regard. But nevertheless, right, this is the first um, foreign treaty between the United States and another nation, and it's the United States acknowledging the sovereignty of Delawares uh, or Lenape's. And then just a few years later, you get one of the most um, uh, sort of horrific incidents uh, against native peoples, the Ganadahadan massacre, um, which again happens where uh, many Lenape's are on Western Pennsylvania and the Ohio country, where um, a bunch of Pennsylvania militia basically massacred almost a hundred uh, Moravian Christian Lenape's. So, you know, a few years earlier, you get this treaty recognizing sovereignty, and then partly because of misunderstandings and partly because of ongoing violence over um, want for land and other ideas about fears of Native Americans, you get a massacre. This, this is the history of the relationship. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit from history to, to memory and images. Um, this is a crucial painting in the history of North America. Um, Benjamin West's painting of the death of General Wolf. It's one of the first European paintings that takes place in the in North America, in the Americas. Um, and it's a battle from the French and Indian War and the death of General Wolf. But you can actually see this figure in the bottom right, prominently somewhat, some people say, uh, a native figure, right? So in, in this grand, this new grand tradition of, of history painting in the Americas from Europeans, um, Indigenous peoples are present. In this case, he's kind of a, you know, a side character, but they're present. And so I want to note that. Um, we get another painting from Benjamin West, Penn's Treaty with the Indians, that's kind of even more evocative. And this is a central um, plot line between Lenape's um, uh, and presumably Lenape's and William Penn. And it's this kind of positive moment of, of, um, of uh, agreeing to live uh, together. Um, and right, this is 1770s. So by that point, that's kind of anachronistic and it's not necessarily that peaceful. And again, we know it's about to happen in a few more years. And again, this is a, a content warning. It's a kind of rough image. John Vanderlyn's painting, The Murder of Jane McCrea. So we've gone from paintings of an Indian figure uh, partaking in, in battle, um, but alongside uh, the British to uh, a, an agreement between William Penn and Lenape's to then this kind of violent image of Indians. And so these three paintings kind of represent the, the overall European imagery of indigenous peoples. Okay, so it's, it's that um, context of representation and images that we then get this, this theme or whatever you wanna call it, trope of Washington crossing the Delaware. In 1819, Thomas Sully does this painting which to be honest, aesthetically is actually my favorite. I think it's a really, really beautiful painting. Um, we get uh, George Caleb Bingham doing Washington Crossing the Delaware in 1856 to 1871, interesting painting. And then um, the most famous one a few years earlier, then Bingham is Lloyd's Washington Crossing the Delaware of 1851. Again, it's this grand celebration of the heroism of the battles of the American Revolution, 
the founding of the United States, George Washington as, as a leader in all of that. Um, and what I am trying to argue here is that what's missing is the recognition of Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homelands, and uh, Lenape peoples and indigenous peoples more generally. Um, moccasins notwithstanding. And I just want to give people a sense of this. This is a massive painting. It is grand. So that's actually Betsy Kornhauser, a curator at the Met in the middle, and then there's some kids for a, a kids event. But this is a massive painting at the Met. Um, if you've never been to see it, please go take a look. It, it is kind of stunning. Um, and it was popular. So it gets reproduced in all of these forms. So here's Thomas Kelly with a lithograph. Um, uh, on the left, you have a novelty card from the early 20th century. And I love this one on the right. This is a bakery card. I had not heard of that term, but so the Gordon Bakery Company would include these cards um, along with a loaf of bread. And so one of them was Washington crossing the Delaware. That, so that's how popular this, this image becomes. But I've got this map here again to remind us of what's happening all the while we've got this kind of heroic image of the founding of the United States or, or one heroic image of the founding of the United States. The ongoing colonization of, of North America, of the lands that become the United States um, and same specifically for the Napes. This memorialization of the crossing continues to the present day. So there's actually Washington Crossing State Park in New Jersey, there's a similar park in Pennsylvania, and there are actually areas in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey called Washington Crossing. Um, they're sort of unincorporated territories or something like that, I think. But to, to mark this, this spot, you see on the left, um, there's a plaque, and then even the state quarter for New Jersey, you know, it, it's so uh, symbolically important or, or connected. And there are reenactors, this is just a few years ago, uh, doing the scene and going the correct direction. I want to note quickly, I'm not going to talk about this much, but um, other artists have riffed on this theme. So the African-American artist Robert Colescott painted this image, uh, 1975, George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware. Um, and this is also a stunning painting. It's quite large. Roger Shimomura, Shimomura crossing the Delaware um, in 2010. So it's interesting that um, other uh, artists including you know, non-white artists are finding meaning or finding ways to express themselves through this trope of Washington crossing the Delaware. But I will maintain the thing that's missing from these um, and from everything is this history of colonization and the reality of Lenape hooking. Um, we see these kinds of things in, in other reflections or reactions to um, uh, place to indigenous place in New Jersey. So there was an exhibition at the Princeton University Art Museum a, a couple of years ago called Nature's Nation on art and the environment in the United States. And there was a, a, a piece in there that was, you know, in a room with lots of other stuff. So perhaps it was easy for some people to miss, but it was this wampum belt, but it wasn't a historic wamp wampum belt. It was made in 2013 um, by a guy named uh, J.R. Norwood, um, who's Natchikok Lenape. And it was this um, wampum belt, not to symbolize a treaty or some sort of peaceful uh, moment, but rather to reflect uh, and express frustration at the lack of ongoing recognition that's happening in the 20th and 21st centuries. And so I, I found that to be a striking um, object and rebuke and to sit in a museum that is on, uh, that is in Lenape Hoking. Um, some of my thinking here was inspired by um, an initiative at the Metropolitan Museum of Art called Native Perspectives that only has started recently, where the institution has recognized that so much of their artwork is representations of Native Americans, usually by non-Native artists. And so uh, to, to rectify the sort of unidirectionality of that representation, they invited a number of indigenous thinkers and scholars and activists and artists to reflect on individual works of art. And they actually had someone uh, respond to Washington crossing the Delaware, the Mohawk artist, Alan Michelson. Um, and so he said, the boatman pictured in the stern wears native moccasins, leggings, and a shoulder pouch, and likely represents an indigenous member of Washington troop, Washington's troops, right? Which is a real historical thing. 
Native American warriors fought often decisively on both sides of the war, British and American, according to, their nation, according to their nation's interest. In 1778, the United States signed a treaty with the Lenape, Delaware, its first formal treaty with an indigenous nation, securing assistance and safe passage through Delaware land in exchange for articles of clothing, utensils, and implements of war. The treaty recognized Delaware sovereignty, granted territorial rights, and offered the possibility of indigenous statehood, which didn't happen. But soon a double crossing of the Delaware took place. Persistent treaty violations by settlers and the US government culminated in the 1782 Ganaden Huden massacre in which a Pennsylvania militia killed 96 defenseless Christian Lenape. Virtually all of America's indigenous allies suffered similar fates. So what's important about this is that you have that massive painting of Washington crossing the Delaware sitting in the galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's this grand painting that many people find heroic um, and, and just kind of overwhelming, but that is taking place on Lenape Hoking and doesn't acknowledge it. And now it does because of this label. So this label is on the wall. Um, and so I just want to end quickly with um, a final really powerful reflection and, and um, what some have called the speaking back to a colonial framing, which is Kent Monkman's massive two-part uh, painting, Misty Kosiwak, or Wooden Boat People. So you see the two images here. This was commissioned for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Kent Monkman is a Canadian Cree artist. And as you can see on the right, one of the two paintings is also very much a riff on Washington crossing the Delaware, except the figure of Washington is now occupied by Monkman himself, kind of in an altar image that he uses in many of his other paintings. And the boat is filled with indigenous peoples in this kind of turbulent sea. So in many ways, it's a, it's a talking back to that original image and a recognition of indigenous presence. Um, and I wanna note that in light of these artworks and, and these perspectives, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has done their own acknowledgement. And now it says on the outside of the museum that they recognize they're on indigenous land. Um, what comes of that, you know, that's that's less clear, but I'll just end with, with this picture. And hopefully anytime you see this image of Washington crossing the Delaware, you'll now see this map of Lenape hooking imposed upon it and, and think about the ways that this painting uh, does show some things and does not show others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slavey. We really appreciate that presentation. Um, and um, can you also please put um, the audience, if you if you may, um, please put in the chat, I guess, the link to the Slate Magazine slide and the, Ar the Arcus map that initially I, I guess I couldn't see. So thank you very much. We look forward to engaging with you in the question and answer session. And now I will present uh, Dr. Stephen Hahn. Um, again, he is the professor emeritus at the Department of English um, at William Patterson University. His paper is called Acknowledgement and Erasure of Indigenous Presence and White Settler Guilt in Washington Irving's, quote, On Passaic Falls, a poem of 1806, end quote. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Hahn. Hi, thank you. Um... In terms of, uh, it, well, I spent the last, um, or close to the last 45 years in New Jersey, um, talking to you now from the, the current state of Maine, um, the Wabanaki homeland. And um, if you're interested in uh, indigenous people here, um, uh, you can um, get information by um, uh, looking up wabanakireach.org. Uh, on the web, uh, you may have seen the uh, film Dawnland, which is about um, recent history of um, uh, reconciliation over um, uh, issues of, of um, um, uh, sovereignty and of uh, children being um, forced into white, uh, indigenous children being forced into white uh, homes. Um, uh, a continuation, surprisingly enough, until the very uh, recent history um, of uh, older practices of um, um, whitening of indigenous peoples. Uh, uh, the principal um, uh, uh, sovereign peoples in, in this region, um, again, the borders are 
Um, this region was contested uh, with, with Indians uh, by Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, uh, and uh, ultimately then um, United States over um, in English and Scots settlers. Uh, uh, Mi'kmaq people, Malasi, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy currently make up the um, Wabanaki uh, um, um, sovereign peoples. Um, so uh, my, my talk today is going to focus um, in on a poem um, uh, about, I'm going to forego um, um, a, a slideshow with it, but focus in on, on the Great Falls of the Passaic and a specific uh, issue that came up uh, when I was asked, um, uh, I, I was doing uh, a, a letter of recommendation for a grant for the Hamilton Partnership for Patterson, which is a support group for uh, the Great Falls National Park. And um, so I was writing about the significance of the, the Great Falls in William Carlos Williams's long poem, Patterson. And the president of the partnership asked me because they had this poem uh, on Passaic Falls, a poem of 1806 um, on their website as part of the literary heritage of the, of the falls. And uh, so he asked me, uh, what do you think of Washington Irving's on Passaic Falls as a work of poetry and part of the story? Um, and so I said, well, um, first of all, it depends on, uh, what text of the poem you're um, talking about. And then of, of course, um, what story, whose story. And um, um, that, what I refer to as a, a whole submerged story in an apparently simple question. Um, my purpose in this presentation is to outline, if not uh, to complete an overview of questions raised when viewing the poem in an historical context in relation to the place named Passaic Falls, um, especially for the purposes of public history, um, while presenting the contents of the poem as evidence of a pattern of acknowledgement and erasure, erasure of white settler guilt in the literature of the early Republic. As such, it belongs to the history of white people's renarrations of the story of contact with indigenous people represented as spectral presences, ghost, turning any actual predecessor into a disappearing shadow of a being. In Renee Berglund's words, the ghosting of Indians is a technique of removal. By writing about Indians as ghosts, she argues, white writers effectively remove them from American lands and place them instead within the American imaginary. Um, you'll see in a minute why, how the um, topic of ghosting comes up. <clears throat> if the more or less official story addressed in the literature of the National Historical Park is the advancement of industrial civilization and democracy, the poem, The Passaic Falls, a poem of 1806, briefly presents a sort of prehistorical counter narrative of exclusion and settler barbarism but it does so in a manner that obscures the agency of historical actors in the imaginary drama and relegates conflict to an easy, but easily, an un, uneasy, but easily disowned past, as though after all, it was an unhappy dream. A prolific author who took an extended interest in what became called, came to be called Indian affairs Washington Irving was an infrequent poet. The volume titled Poems of Washington Irving brought together from various sources published by the New York Public Library in 1931 runs to only 19 pages, including a one page introduction by its editor, its title and copyright pages. On Passaic Falls written in the year 1806 leads off in the order of the slim volume. It is prefaced by a note that gives a series of publication dates beginning with the Atlantic Souvenir, 1827, noting the subsequent publications in 1837 in the New York Book of Poetry, 
uh, in which stanzas five, six, and seven, seven and 10 are omitted. And that's the key part of the argument um, is that from a 12 stanza poem, it's reduced to an eight stanza poem. And what is troubling about these particular four stanzas? Just to indicate how um, uh, popular it, it was as a piece of poetry, it's um, uh, uh, been, had been published first in uh, as uh, under the title from the Passaic album, Visitors Weekly, Our Lady's Miscellany in 1806. Uh, in lines written at the Falls of the Passaic in Portfolio in 1814 and um, reprinted elsewhere. <coughs> the phrase from the Passaic album refers it back to a, a supposed uh, album of fugitive pieces by a variety of authors who visited a tavern owned by Captain Abraham Godwin at the Great Falls. <clears throat> and hence in um, a number of republications that follow using uh, usage of words like album and a tradition. So the, at the time it was connecting back to people's visits um, to the specific place and Washington Irving's actual visit there. Uh, Irving had visited, um, even though he's known mainly for New York State, um, visits and, and his Catskill literature um, uh, at the time he had visited Rutherford and Patterson and um, knew um, the something of the colonial history of um, New Jersey. So um, what uh, in terms of the public assessment for public history, Irving's poem both is and isn't faithful to the title of On Passaic Falls because while it discusses, focuses on describing geographic features of the falls, its broader theme is the extirpation of unnamed indigenous people from the envisioned landscape of the poem and the survival of the composite figure of white settlers as strangers to them and pale savages who gaze on the scenes of the falls with wondering eye while bearing for the reader the guilty association of having murdered in their passion the red men who previously inhabited a simple a pastoral landscape. Indeed, the poem seems to imply that the pale savages, the white settlers, contrived to transform the landscape from one of, to one of ruin and terror. Uh, quoting from the poem, but the spirit that ruled the thick tangled wood and had fixed in its gloomy recess his abode, loved best the rude scene that the whirlwinds deform and gloried in thunder and lightning and storm. All flushed from the tumult of battle he came where the red men encountered the children of flame, where the noise of the war hope still rung in his ears and the fresh bleeding scalp as a trophy he wears. This is the children of flame being the white settlers <coughs> and who are uh, taking the scalps as a trophy. Oh, deep was the horror and fierce was the fight when the eyes of the red men were shouted, shrouded in night when by strangers invaded, by strangers destroyed, they ensanguined the field which their fathers endure joy. These intense line replete with cliches of bloody con conflict, um, not to mention examples of Indianese that, uh, that we'll see in a moment, uh, depict and bring forward in the imagination scenes of genocide only to lay them gently to rest in the two concluding stanzas as they are relegated to the past in the midst of a somewhat ambiguous present. Countless moons have ro since rolled in this long lapse of time. Cultivation has softened those features sublime. The acts of the white man enlivened the shade and dispelled the deep gloom of the thicketed glade. Yet the stranger still gazes with wondering eye on rocks rudely torn and groves mounted high, still loves on cliffs 
the cliff's dizzy border to groan, where the torrent leaps headlong and bosom bosomed in foam. Um, basically, the the idea of the 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 poem is the the white settlers come and and granted they murder uh, indigenous people, but they bring the benefit of cultivation, which not historically true, um, but supposedly was not there prior to their entry onto the scene. The poem thus represents for contemplation, the scene of warfare as excess and madness in the fight to the death between the pale savages who are the children of flame <clears throat> as a, uh, invading strangers who shifted, shifting to the past tense, destroyed the red men and ensanguined the fields with which their fathers enjoyed, only to return to the scene in which the white men enlivened the shade and dispelled the deep gloom of the thickening plague. Irving's poem presents a, 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 to take up the question of the removal of particularly horrendous stanzas from the poem. Um, Irving's poem represents a peculiar circuit of sympathy to the fictive red men and hostility to the white attackers as they ensanguined the ground with indigenous blood. The option depicts the usual grounding, that, that the action depicted lacks the usual grounding necessity that legitimatizes the use of force in Western European law and morality. And the poem gives no reason such as a counterattack for the actions of settlers and going back to Christopher's um, uh, talk. Uh, Lenape in, uh, in New Jersey were actually quite uh, accommodating um, and, uh, to um, white settlers. And it was a, a couple of particular incidents in what was called Keith's War um, that, uh, that stirred them up to, to um, fight. Um, and uh, so the depiction of the action of warfare is something that would have happened two centuries, a century and a half before um, uh, Washington Irving was at the Great Falls and um, a long time had passed since um, that, was, that kind of um, interaction had taken place. Um, despite the, the aberration from the usual appeal to necessity, as a replacement for the displacement of indigenous people by colonial settlers, the poem as a whole, the version containing 12 stanzas in a re reduced version of eight stanzas, stanzas, follows a pattern of many poems and other literary works of the early 19th century, recalling the conflict and removal of indigenous people from the colonial frontiers of the Northeast. These poems and other narratives were especially prevalent in the years of the formation of the nation from who, which those indigenous people would be juridically excluded, disenfranchised, and made to disappear from the scene without the troubling psychological consequences for the conqueror who, unable to erase historical memory, still gazes with wondering eye on rocks rudely torn and groves mounted high. The difference for Irving's poem resides in two things. First, the remarkable vision of the effect of violence on the white stranger's inheritance as the phantasm of a murderous ba battle seems to have as a consequence the rape of the landscape. He rides the green hills, wild woods he laid low. He turned the still stream and rough channels to flow. He root rent the rude rock the steep precipice gave and hurled down the chasm, the thundering wave. Such improvements by way of preparing the way for history are the sole justification in a latter day for taking possession of the scene depicted, oddly dislocated in time from any actual scene of battle between white settlers 
and indigenous people. In the manner of Northern New Jersey, the er area of the Great Falls remained remote until well after the vicious wars of the mid 17th century that occurred in the vicinity of present day Jersey City at Pavonia on Staten Island and the shores of Man Manhattan. By Irving's time, indigenous people had indeed been, moved, been removed as a presence in any significant numbers in the population of the area of present day Patterson and the Great Falls as their survivors had been removed from political franchise by the settler means of universal white privilege, the legal appropriation of property and forced removal to other sections of in unincorporated borders of the country and eventually within the reservations of that country. In effect, the local negotiations, treaties, et cetera, predominantly did not allow non-white people to own property and therefore, um, if you didn't own property, you were subject to removal. You were, um, uh, the short but intense incursions of actions such as Keith's War, which seems to be recalled in the poem, on the early Eastern frontiers gave way to the less obvious machination of courts and settlements for the nullification of treaties and grants on the basis of the so-called higher, lo so higher laws and principle. The poem is not true then exactly to the history of the action of civilization around the Great Falls, as the first recorded visits of white settlers to the falls occurred well after these violent actions had taken place, and also occurred well before the time of Irving's visit in 1806. So the historicity of the poem is in this sense unhinged from reference in both time and place, but I would argue not from another historical truth of the foundation of conquest and acts of violence and rupture of the presumed order of nature, which are then erased by the institution of a secondary semblance of order, a second nature as a consequence of the removal of agents of cultural difference. That is, the indigenous people barely appear in, either in imaginative literature or later historical documents in the Lower Passaic Valley, Patterson and South, South, except as the subject of occasional encounters and legal actions separating themselves from land to which they hold no legal title and being relocated occasionally with some composition, compensation to communities of other kindred in remoter but still precarious <clears throat> settlements in Wisconsin. Uh, in what is now Oklahoma. The red men of the poem in this reading are spectral images of those remote ancestors and later non-citizens displaced to the further frontiers of the early, by the early 19th century. The crazed white settlers of the poem were of course also spectral, uh, spectral by the time of the poem, though the collective guilt still appears in the imaginary world of the poem to wander in the territory of the falls, a sign of unease. All of this may lead us to surprise, surprise that why, about why just those four out of 12 stanzas were excised and erased in the later published versions of the poem around the time of the Indian removals of the Jacksonian period. <clears throat> the short answer, uh, sorry, the answer seems to be that Irving had gone too far in his portrayal of the conflict to reveal its origin in a repetitive desire for conquest. Irving, as we know, attempted in his later writing to provide a modulated view of the red man as he also joined the throngs of writers who celebrated the memory of their presence in the absence of their actual lives, a rupture and yield by the passage of time in the language of in the Indianese language of the poem of countless moons. Hyperbole aside, one could of course count them, the number of moons, both from both the violent actions of the mid 19th century and the subtler larger legal machinations depriving indigenous people, even those who has become 
Christianized and adopted European names of rights to property under the terms of white settlement, terms that largely define them out of existence. To return to the question with which I began, involving on the one hand, the historical question of how the poem fits into the story and on the other, but not unrelated hand of how the poem succeeds aesthetically. The poem telescopes the perspectives of time and place, suggesting that events occurring elsewhere in a definitely determined times occurred at the falls, but in a distant and immemorial past. As a statement of historical fact, it is in that sense as false as one might reasonably expect a poem to be. But in another sense, the poem lays bare an ethical perspective on the broader action of the extirpation of indigenous people from the region by attributing the sailors, the settlers' actions to a, to a madness to dominate and exterminate opposition to ownership. How the author himself was implicated in the continuing problem of employing an historical slate of hand to express both sympathy with the oppressed and guilty knowledge of previous actions while accepting the right results of white settler domination and what the greater consequences of this moral ambivalence were as it extended into the 1830s in the midst of other acts of removal and other massacres is a further story. As to the question of aesthetics, the question almost becomes moot as it depends on the reader's susceptibility to the poem's claims to relegating the action of the present into the past of memory. Ambivalence is ambivalence and is a difficult tenor to sustain in the face of the unfolding of a history that continues to reveal what the narrative, what the narrative has contrived to undisclose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Han, for that presentation, nuanced presentation. So I'm going to invite, um, we, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so if you have any questions, please share them in the Q&A box. Um, and that would be great. So actually, uh, Mr. Slaby, I actually had a question about the um, Monkman um, painting. What, what was the date of that uh, piece? So it was finished in 2019. Um, he was commissioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art to, to make that piece. Um, I believe it was an open commission, so it was whatever he wanted to do. It was meant to be somewhat large and monumental. Um, it's part of a, an initiative at the Metropolitan Museum of Art to commission contemporary artists and um, especially to intentionally uh, commission works of art from diverse artists. So um, I think Monkman was either the first or the, the second one that they, they did with this new initiative. So it was very intentionally, um, I assume in this case, you know, seeking out the, the voice of an Indigenous artist. Um, and Monkman's an interesting case because he's, I think, quite well known and popular within Canada. Um, he's been active for probably something like 20 years. He makes very, very vibrant um, and compelling images that are often riffs on the history of painting, whether that's the history of modern European painting or the history of North American landscape painting. Um, but he, he does this in a very playful and um, sometimes body way. Um, and so I assume the Met knew what it was getting into. And he actually created um, a kind of serious and dark work which perhaps had something to do with the moment in time that he was creating it, right? The second half of the, the 20 teens. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a very recent work. Um, it has uh, themes of immigration and themes of climate change, as well as uh, indigenous persistence um, and survival. Um, it's, it's a fantastic work. I don't think it's on view right now. It was on view for about a year and a half and then I think prolonged with the pandemic, but hopefully it'll be on view again. And you can go to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts website. They have high resolution images. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, and so Dr. Han, I just had um, some questions as far as have there been indigenous artists who have engaged the poem as far as taking like a, a, a high critical stance of it? Yeah, not to my knowledge. Um, that, uh, the, uh, that poem kind of, as I said, first of all, um, um, uh, He's not known as, as a poet. There's only uh, a, about 20 uh, uh, poems that Washington Irving actually wrote. And um, he's thought of uh, much more um, um, in terms of the Hudson River Valley and Catskills and so on. But he also, uh, in this later period, he, uh, he gets involved with um, a, a person named Henry Schoolcraft. Uh, he works for the... Um, uh, Henry Schoolcraft um, uh, marries an indigenous woman, and he's um, he's uh, uh, what we now call an anthropologist. Although anthropologist in the 19th century, a little bit compromised position. They're a little bit, um, uh, and they're, they're, it's famous for male anthropologists to go and study uh, indigenous people in North America, and then wind up marrying people from the indigenous people that they go to visit, uh, sometimes more than one. Uh, and so there's, um, so, you know, there's a little bit of a compromised position. So, uh, but Washington Irving ultimately goes uh, to uh, the, the Western, um, the Western borders um, in Indian territory, Oklahoma, et cetera. And he tries to have this sort of balanced liberal view of Indians as, as sovereign people, um, which, which the part of my point is that the, that the machinations of the legal apparatus of the nation as it is forming is never going to allow it. It doesn't allow it really today. Um, as soon as, as soon as in, as in Christopher's talk, as soon as the word uh, uh, nation is written down, uh, sovereignty is written down on any treaty with um, uh, uh, indigenous people, it's taken away, it's gone. It's like, okay, nullify that treaty. Nope, no, we didn't have authority to sign it, et cetera. So Washington Irving is a, it's a, is a sort of classic, classic um, uh, first half of the uh, 19th century liberal trying to um, accommodate both ends when they're just gonna keep grading against each other. Um, and the, 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 um, the, there's a whole other history of special uh, issues of, of the English and Dutch um, as opposed to the Spanish and Portuguese in, in their rationalization why they can become um, uh, to dominate in, in North America. The principal part of that is that they cultivate the land, which requires the myth that, that Native Americans are not cultivating the land. So they have to suppress that. They're just, they're just hunters. They don't have any investment in the land. We do. And the whole history of uh, European property law just bulldozes its way in. Short story. <laughs> Nicole, you're, uh, Noel, you're um, muted. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you, Mr. Slaby, for um, adding the link um, regarding Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and so I was just wondering, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, if you all had any closing comments um, for this panel, or if you had any reflections on either of your presentations um, before we um, close the conference for today and return in the morning, so. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just, um, there's a part of what I left out had to do with the mid 17th century where uh, the um, scenes of 
of conflict come from? Something called Keefe's War. Yeah. Um, Keefe had been involved in, in New England, went down. Um, he, he was actually like the end on, the, on this first frontier. Um, he was the last um, of, the, of the people who were out there to massacre Indians um, because other settlers said, you know what? You're just roiling people up to fight against us. Just leave it alone. And eventually we'll get people to move out of the neighborhood. And that's, what, that's the process that took over. Mm. Um, it, but it doesn't make it an exciting story. You know, litigating against your neighbor is not necessarily exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing I was thinking when you brought up Keith's War, um, I was reading again about Keith's War, I think two weeks ago, is why exactly, it's, it's interesting for such a, for such a um, distinct event that happened here in Northern New Jersey. I'm, I'm based here in Newark. Um, right. And so we're talking about like Jersey City, Pavonia, Hoboken, the coast over there. Um, why in many ways um, it hasn't become some, um, you know, more of an event that's been shared um, in the educational and um, in liberal, liberal spaces. And so, you know, one of those things I'm very interested in, in um, continuing to share the story. I think I found, um, there was a print from um, New York Library where it's a depiction of the um, war in Pavonia or the massacre in Pavonia. Mm -hmm. But um, thank you for bringing up Keith's War because um, it is a significant act of um, just kind of ruthless behavior that really disturbs the myth of how we think of indigenous folks here in the Northeast, here in, in New Jersey, particularly. There's, there's another um, subsequent um, uh, uh, segment of the story, the in-between story which has to do with Hackensack and the Hackensack mm -hmm. uh, and Oritani. And there they, they actually try to negotiate um, with, with the English um, uh, and they're just worn down. And Oritani, who's the leader, Oritani just finally dies and nobody has quite the, uh, the skills in negotiation, the language skills um, in, with, the, with the English that he had. And um, so the so the resistance <clears throat> that might have been um, made on a political basis there uh, falls apart, and there's no unification of the um, the people. But the, the 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 problem is nobody's really written that history. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, the late nineteenth century histories of Patterson, et cetera, where people actually go back. And get the records. They just they they skim over it. You know, here's the exciting military history, and then um, here how how the processes of transfer um, of how people were actually removed nonviolently, let us say, um, uh, from from the premises um, actually occurred. Nobody's done the research and really written that deeply about it. I just uh, want to say, uh -huh. I, no, I just, I wanted to say, I really appreciate both of those points because uh, again, I, I think it relates to both of the, our talks, um, both the, in my mind, what I consider the, the issue of a usable past mm -hmm. in, in the ways that um, uh, events, people, places of the past become these um, meaningful tools for artists and other creative people to um, to do what they do, but you know they're 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 not historians say their goal isn't um, truth in that way. It's truth in a very different kind of way, I think. And so it's such a, a messy project. And the thing that um, is always difficult for me is that I'm I'm trying to get out a very different kind of truth, and I think in part it doesn't necessarily exist there. But you have the truth of actual historical events. You have um, you have the the truth of the 
representation itself, whatever that is, and then the purpose, you know, but, but then it has these reverberations and things, meaning changes over time, right? Um, and so you've got that on the one hand, and then this other point that we've just been talking about, that there are these fractured stories um, and fractured histories, especially, I, I, I might be biased because I work on the East Coast and Native history in the East and the Northeast, but I think it's a bit different in other places in the U.S. where um, the, the history of contact and interaction between Indigenous peoples and uh, settlers, um, because of when it happened and how it happened, was not as successful at fracturing the historical record and just the history of various peoples. But if you look at places like New Jersey and New York, it's a mess. The historical mm -hmm. record is a mess and yeah. the actual histories, we're still trying to, to piece together these, these accurate stories of diverse peoples and they have been so scattered, right? Mm -hmm. their, their descendants exist all over the continent, but um, yeah. actually get back to, to the intertwining of what really happened and then how it was represented, it's, it's quite a feat. And I think we're, yeah. that's where we are right now. Right. So um, uh, the informants are, are two generations away and, and 2000 miles away. And when people start to say, well, do you have any letters? Did you bring anything with you to Oklahoma, Colorado, wherever? Um, I, that's just, um, yeah, compared to, you know, white Puritan records in New England, et cetera, which are, you know, yeah. Um, if we have a minute, um, the, um, the, the erasure uh, part, if you look at the report, the 2019 report on the historical resources for the National Historical Park, it begins by saying the first Americans at the Great Falls were there in 9,000 BC. Well, those people have never, that's, that's a gloss. Those people weren't, there was no America then, and they, they were never were, they never did become part of America. Mm. As in, 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 and then it ends up, uh, it, it skips over uh, all indigenous history and it becomes um, the, these little hamlets around with the blacksmith and the little hamlets. And then, you know, like uh, this is Parson Weems, speaking of George Washington, this, this is Parson, but it's a national, it's, it's, it's commissioned by uh, what, what normally is a fairly rigorous organization, um, the, the National um, Parks System usually gets down to nitty gritty stuff, but it's just romance. <laughs> It, it's amazing the power of mm. some of these certain forms of representation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to close out for today. Um, I want to thank you again, um, Dr. Han and um, Dr. Slavy, for participating um, on this panel today. Um, and um, I would like to look forward encourage everyone to join us again tomorrow um, for our panels and our keynote. Um, and thank you all for engaging today. And um, Have a great evening. Thank you. Oh, and this will all be recorded um, and will be available on our YouTube channel probably in the next um, two weeks. So you'll be able to um, share it with your colleagues and other people um, and students and folks who are interested. So um, it can continue to kind of um, not only educate people, but also push that interest in doing the research, doing the work, um, the memory work, the historical work of um, amplifying the narratives that we're looking to do. So have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.